Well, good morning and welcome once again to Sunday School at the First United Methodist Church in Brookhaven, Mississippi. I thank you for tuning in and uh, watching this morning. And before we get started, I want to give a shout out to a certain group, and that would be the camp counselors at Camp Lake Stevens. I heard through the grapevine that you guys tuned in a couple of Sundays ago. I hope you watch this Sunday and you get to hear this because I want you to know that you are, I am so grateful for you and that I've been praying for you because whether you know it or not, you're influencing someone at that camp. You may not realize it, but someone is watching you and growing from what, you, what they see in you. And I thank you for that. Now let's get started with a word of prayer this morning. Thank you, God, for today, this very moment. Help us, Lord, to learn from you and discern your wisdoms so that we can apply them to our lives. Help us, Lord, as we try to grapple with the great question of today and apply it and see, Lord, that we need to be better servants and to understand the word better. Thank you for our Sunday school class, our online presence. Thank you, God, for those who attend regularly. We just pray for everyone, Lord, that is associated with our church and our community. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. <clears throat> I hope by now that you have met and seen our new pastor. If you've not, <clears throat> please make an effort to do so. We're so looking forward to his serving our, our church. Today we find ourselves on the, in the fourth Sunday of Acts, that we're of the five that we're spending in Acts. So our, <clears throat> our, uh, our, our lesson last week was a little late getting online. We had a little technical difficulty and we apologize to you for that. But if you missed last Sunday's lesson on Sunday morning and you thought maybe we didn't put one up, we did eventually get one up and it is on the, uh, on YouTube and on, on Facebook, on our <clears throat> Facebook page. So please tune in if you, if you missed it. Last week, we saw Peter defend himself from the Judaizers upon his return from Cornelius' uh, from his visit with Cornelius. And <clears throat> we see this question about what does it take? How do you become a Christian? Are there limitations on becoming? A, do you have to be a Jew, practicing Jew to be a Christian? This issue continues this week. And let's try to connect last week and this week. So some of the scattered <clears throat> from the persecution in Jerusalem made their way to Antioch. And there, they preached to the Greeks, and large numbers believed. So many so that the church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch to check them out, see what was going on. Well, to Barnabas's credit, the first thing he does is he goes on to Tarsus, and gathers up Paul and brings them back to and brings him back to Antioch. And so we see then that when when they get back to uh, to Antioch, they continue their work, and the believers were first called Christian in Antioch. And while we're there, there is a prophet in Antioch who prophesies about a famine coming to Jerusalem. And so the Antioch church takes a love offering and sends it by Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. In the meantime, we see that James, John's brother has been martyred in Jerusalem. So the persecution continues. Peter is arrested and an angel releases him. 
Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch and they bring Mark with them. And from there, they set out on their, on Paul's, what we call Paul's first missionary journey. And I wish we had time to go to every church, but we just don't. So let me just say that this is the first, this, he sailed to Cyprus and then from Cyprus on to the churches in the, um, in this area, well, into, into the, where he settled the first churches. The Jews oppose Paul and they send some Judaizers into the churches that he had been in. And uh, Paul declares that he now turns to the Gentiles, that he's, that he's not going to consider himself just a Jewish preacher. And so Paul and Barnabas are considered gods on this trip that they make on their first journey. And then on the way home, Paul and they revisit those churches that they founded on the way back to, to Antioch. In the meantime, the, at, the, at Antioch, the Judaizers had come from Jerusalem and had infiltrated the group and had led some astray. And so that brings us to where we are. When the church at Antioch and Paul and Barnabas come back, they announce we're gonna resolve this. And so Paul and Barnabas and some others in the church go back to Jerusalem. And there we have the first theological conference where doctrine is decided among the church. Now that, that, that gets us, so we have folks in Antioch, folks in Jerusalem. They're not exactly aligned together. So we're gonna see how this affects the church. This brings us to our Sunday school lesson of today. And it is quite a lengthy reading, but I think it's necessary that we hear it. Uh, we'll, re we'll read Acts 15, verses 1 through 21. And it, and it says, Some people came down from Judea, teaching the family of believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom we've received from Moses, you can't be saved. Paul and Barnabas took sides against these Judeans and argued strongly against their position. The church at Antioch appointed Paul and Barnabas and several others from Jerusalem to go up to Jerusalem to set the question before the apostles and the elders. The church sent this delegation on their way. They traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria telling stories about the conversion of the Gentiles to everyone. Their reports thrilled their brothers and sisters. When they arrived in Jerusalem, the church, the apostles and the elders all welcomed them. They gave a full report of what God had accomplished through their activity. Some believers from among the Pharisees stood up and claimed, the Gentiles must be circumcised. They must be required to keep the law from Moses. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider the matter. After much debate, Peter stood and addressed them, fellow believers, you know that early on God chose me from among you as one through whom the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and come to believe. God who knows people's deepest thoughts and desires confirmed this by giving them the Holy Spirit and just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us, as them, us and them but purified their deepest thoughts and desires through faith. Why then are you now challenging God by placing the burden on the shoulders of these disciples that neither we nor our ancestors could bear? On the contrary, we believe that we and they are saved by the same way, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire assembly fell quiet as they returned, as they listened to Paul and Barnabas describe all the signs and wonders God did among the Gentiles through their activity. When Barnabas and Paul also fell silent, James responded, fellow believers, listen to me. Simon reported how in his kindness, God came to the Gentiles in the first place 
to raise them up from the people of God. The prophets agree with this. The, word, the prophets' words agree with this as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild what has been torn down. I will restore it so that the rest of humanity will see the, seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who belong to me. The Lord says this, the one who does not hear these, <clears throat> Lord says this, the one who does not hear these things known from the earliest times. Therefore, I conclude that we shouldn't create problems for Gentiles who turn to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them to avoid the pollution associated with idols, sexual immorality, eating meat from strangled animals, and consuming blood. After all, Moses has been proclaimed to in every city for a long time and is read aloud every Sabbath in, in every synagogue. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow. So we see a, a problem and we see how it is resolved. So the problem was that there were probably Pharisees. I, I think I'm safe to say that they were Pharisees who had this position that to be saved, you had to be circumcised and follow the law. Now, why would they do that? That, if they, if you didn't need to do that, what would be the need in a Pharisee? Uh-oh, a little self-preservation there. Maybe they, were, maybe they were afraid of, of change. Oh, we're not afraid of changes. As Christians, we accept new things, new traditions every day, don't we? Or do we like things just the way they are? Sometimes we need a little stirring up. So they might have had a loss of security. They might have had this feeling that they were no longer needed. <clears throat> they probably were concerned about losing control of the church. Oh, are these issues that we hear about today? I'm afraid so. they just different perspectives. Can you imagine this? Uh, a Jew that had been raised as a Pharisee, that had been taught as a Pharisee, that lived his life as a Pharisee, not to associate with other with Gentiles, not to eat unclean things. And they had lived their life this way. They truly believed that they were in the right. Oh. Do we have anybody on two different sides of an issue that truly believe they're in the right today? I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. So how did this, how did the church resolve that? Well, let's watch what they did. The first of all, they gave the Pharisees their chance to speak. And they listened to him. And then they gave Peter a chance to speak. And Peter, I'm going to give Peter credit here because he was much bolder in this speech than maybe he was in the one last week. <clears throat> he said, God spoke. God, what God did. <clears throat> so then we, they listened also to Paul and Barnabas talk about the impact that they had on the Gentiles and how they were receptive to the word. Wow. And then James responds. What? We widely accept that James is Jesus's brother and that he came to believe and became a person of great influence in the, in the early church. <clears throat> because of his wisdom. Then when, he, when James began to speak, 
He listened to both sides and he addressed both sides. But then he quoted from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And that's what's quoted here when it says, it's recorded in the scripture. <clears throat> what this shows is that the early church was very knowledgeable about the written law, the earlier books of the Bible. And so that we see that, that they, they quoted, he quoted from Amos, who was a prophet. And so we know that, that they listened to the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs and they studied their word. <clears throat> the early church has now faced a crucial time and we've reached this breaking point where are we going to be a Judean sect of Jews, just a kind of, you know, a subset of Judaism? Or are we going to the world? Thanks be to God that we went, that the decision was made to go to the world because it invited me and you to accept Christ. And so Peter addressed these, as James addressed these issues, he shows great, great insight, great discernment from God. And he, he decides, he, he tries to make peace, but he comes right out and says, he, he acknowledges that the Pharisees had a point. <clears throat> he based his decision on a revelation from God and from the Bible. That's a good way to resolve an issue. He was respectful to the Jewish Christians. He gave the Gentiles the duty of refraining from idolatry. In fact, let's revisit exactly what he limited them with one more time as we see these, as he writes this letter. He dictates this letter to go to the, to the, uh, Gentile churches that had been established. <clears throat> we should avoid pollution associated with idols, idol worship, sexual immorality, eating meat from strangled animals and consuming blood. These were all things that were very basic in the Jewish tradition, but I, so the question is, are they limiting or is he saying that if you do these things, you can be saved or are they things that you should refrain from after you've been saved? That's a great question. I don't have a complete answer to that. Um, we might consult with, with uh, some theologian about that, but... <clears throat> Nevertheless, James lays the groundwork for the resolution of this issue. Unfortunately, if you were to go on through Acts, you would see that the, that the issue is not resolved completely, that there are those who are so intent on forcing their belief on the Gentiles that they go to the churches behind Paul and plant seeds of, of, uh, of doubt and, and really slow down the, the, uh, the work of the church. So let's, let's, uh, let's look at some of this. The, Pharisees wanted to put conditions on being welcomed into the church. What are the dangers in doing that? Do you have to be like us to be a member of the church? Or should we, should we encourage diversity? And how would you uh, characterize the way Peter ended his speech? Well, I've already told you that I think that he was a lot bolder in that speech. And so then we get to the resolution of the issue. And we see that 
James based his, his decision on revelation from God and testimony from the Bible. This followed the report of the signs and wonders of Paul and Barnabas. <clears throat> he was respectful to the Jewish Christians, but his resolution affirmed this statement from the student book. The determining factor in resolving debate involves changed lives. Oh. How could the Pharisees Christians have used the Bible to support their claims? Hmm. They could have used, quoted from Leviticus when it was very obvious and there. And, and how do you decide what the Bible means and, and what it says and what it means by what it says? Discernment, prayer, tradition, understanding, discussing it with others. So as we move, what kind of church should we be? Should we be a growing, loving church that accepts others who are not exactly like us? Are we more like the Pharisee or are we more like Paul? Or perhaps we more like James, trying to seek middle ground, middle ground and, and, and come to a resolution. Are we peacemakers? How can I help our church be welcoming to others, creating without creating problems for them? How can I help those inside the church for whom such changes may be threatening? Uh-oh. by being open and aware and loving them and, and loving them through the conflict. As we get ready to close today, I, th I wanna thank you for uh, staying with me through our study of Acts. Next week, we will conclude the study of Acts and really, uh, that's a shame because there's about as much in front of us as it is behind us. But I encourage you to read Acts and, and help understand one of my goals in teaching today, in teaching this series, has been to, to help you understand how the word spread. And it didn't do it by itself. It took sacrifice on people's part. So let's go, let's go to the Lord now in prayer and read the closing prayer in our student book. Found, I apologize, I haven't marked it. Here we go, page 85. Lord, help us to recognize that you love all people, all people. Open our hearts and minds toward others so that we may all come into the unity of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you again for tuning in. Those of you who are watching who might not even be a part of our, our local church here, uh, I thank you for tuning in. We would love to know who you are and where you are. If you'd like to leave a comment, we certainly would like to hear from you. We want you to know that we consider you part of our Sunday school class on Sunday morning. Thank you again.